Join me now is Mark Penn, Chairman and CEO of Stagwell Inc. Mark, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Glad to be here. Great. First, I want to take, I want your take as a legendary pollster on the 2023 Edelman Trust Barometer. It says in short that globally, people believe business is, quote, the only institution seen as competent and ethical. What's your take? Well, I, I think the pandemic was actually very good for business. You know, for many years, the Edelman Trust Barometer had been showing that corporations were in the dumps. And frankly, I didn't particularly buy that finding. Uh, and, and I thought that actually it, it was misleading. And I think that the pandemic proved that it was misleading. Because I think when it, as soon as the pandemic hit, people turned to Amazon, they turned to Federal Express, they turned to the grocery stores, they turned to the CVSs. You know, it really wasn't the government that, that helped them out in times of critical need, uh, as, it, as it was fundamentally a lot of the, the retail and delivery economy and some of the tech companies, you know, Zoom and Microsoft and others, that really created an ability for people to continue to function and to communicate and uh, continue their employment in, in many cases. Uh, and so I think that people always did trust companies more than, they, than the trust barometer showed. And the pandemic showed that, and now I think what it's showing is is in line with, with what I think, which is which is governments are looked at more skeptically, and and companies actually did deliver when people needed it. How did corporations do this, especially pivot so fast in the pandemic, where people were able to trust them like this? Well, look, part of the part of the system, you know, the, the part of the capitalist system, to be honest, or the free enterprise system that we have in America is that private enterprise's ability to innovate, you know, to infuse their companies with tech layers, uh, you know, in order to, to operate more efficiently outstrips the government. I mean, try calling the Social Security Administration. See how long it takes you either get a person or get an appointment. You know, many years ago, uh, when I worked with President Clinton, we put in Rego to reorganize government, but it's gone nowhere. Check out whether even government employees are coming into work. And a recent study showed that, that many of them are both not at work and not logging into their computers. But when you couldn't really get government on the line, private enterprise was there. It was well organized. It was efficient. Uh, it overcame, you know, obstacles in a heroic way. Now the government pumped a lot of money, and I think a lot of people were thankful. For the money, I think the PPP program was was particularly innovative, you know, to keep hard hit businesses run. But at the end of the day, when you needed something done, it really proved the value of the free enterprise system. And government just looked bloated, inefficient, chaotic, unable to really, you know, come up with the right solutions for what needed to be done. In short, did go or did businesses step up, or did government drop the ball? Oh, I think it was definitely some of each. I mean, I, I think people really felt a, a new affinity for the grocery stores and the food delivery system. They felt new affinity for Amazon. Uh, uh, my family lived off Instacart. Uh, and and without any of this, uh, you know, it would have been a break. -in. And the internet, you know, functioned, you know, 100%. And people learned I had been doing, you know, uh, you know, Skype for business and, you know, Zoom type communications for a very long time. But but uh, but I think that that kind of, you know, graduated as to, to something that's in everyday life as people realize, you know, how valuable it, uh, it could be. And, and government, you know, let's face it, you know, if you were looking for government to be really studied, scientific, efficient, you know, what, what I think really happened in the pandemic is that both administrations, the Trump administration and the Biden administration, did something that I would never have recommended, which is they made the pandemic a partisan exercise. Trump had only his people, the Republicans, running it. And Biden had only his people and Democrats running it. Uh, and so they tried to get political advantage when logically Democrats and Republicans should have come together. Probably the military should have played a bigger role probably a daily scientific study of five to 10,000 people 
to really have supplied good information and data about what was happening. I don't think we had good data. We didn't have really good efficient policy making. And we certainly didn't have a kind of a national unity push that people look for from, from the government in times like that. I think, I know hindsight really is 2020, but how would have the pandemic played out if it wasn't as politicized? How, do you think Trump would still be president? I know it's hard to predict, but what are your thoughts? Uh, I, I have no idea whether Trump would still be president. Uh, he probably would have had a much better chance had he, in fact, been able to get bipartisan cooperation, create a task force, you know, that was like that. And I would have strongly recommended somebody from the military had it. The policy advisors would be on it, but not the final word. Uh, and look, some of the things that Trump did in terms of uh, mobilizing resources and particularly getting behind, you know, uh, Operation Warp Speed were innovative. And, and without the vaccine coming when it did, I think there would have been far more deaths. But uh, I don't think either administration lived up to the, the promise of in a national emergency, put the partisanship aside, bring together a unity task force, work together, you know, don't fight for political advantage over issues like a pandemic. It, it's, it's wrong, it's inefficient. And in the end, both parties are losers when that happens. Going back to the poll, and this really touches on your point, is that 51% of people trust the government and 50% of people trust the media. What are your thoughts? Uh, well, that's a high number for the media. I mean, the media didn't, didn't get a lot of trust. Um, look, I, I think that when you look at trust ratings generally, uh, well-trusted institutions kind of start at a 60% rating and go up to an 80, 85% rating. Um, if I look at recent ratings in our polls, the Harris poll uh, that I'm chairman of, you know, we have very high ratings for the military, high ratings for Amazon, Google very low ratings for, uh, for Facebook. But when something becomes politicized, its ratings become 50-50. Mm -hmm. Half the people like it, half the people don't like it. And then you get stuck in that mode. And when things rise above politics, then you could get 60, 70, 80, even I haven't seen 90 lately. You know, when I worked with President Clinton, our presidential approval ratings uh, went as high as 75 at that time. And each of the presidents lately have been so partisan that they haven't been able to achieve anything above 55 for more than a, a month or two. It may not come as a surprise that many people aren't very trustworthy of the government. So I'd love your take on the classified document scandal brewing for President Biden right now. Well, I do think that the classified document scandals are, are, are a little bit of a of a diversion in, in the sense that the, these laws on classified documents were never meant to ensnarl a president, a vice president, a secretary of state. They were really meant to catch spies and people who were selling secrets. Uh, and, and so the fact that we have all these independent councils, and Department of Justice, criminal investigations on all this. I think it's a diversion. I think that there are serious questions about Biden and the Biden family operation, you know, as it relates to influence peddling and tax payments, whether Biden was or wasn't getting the money. But look, there are a lot of questions about where these documents were, how did they get there, uh, who discovered them really, when did they discover them? Are they being honest with the American people? Those are a lot of good questions. I don't think those should be big questions that our entire Department of Justice spends its time on. At, at the end of the day, uh, classified documents are meant for the president and the vice president. That's who they're generated for. They are the decision makers of the country. Uh, so it's a little odd to really ensnare them you know, in this way over this, whereas there are meaningful questions. I think there were meaningful questions about 
about Trump and what he did on January 6th. And I think there are meaningful questions about Biden uh, and the operation with his son uh, and, and brother. And I think the meaningful questions get pushed aside because it's, it's just so much easier to focus on, you know, classified documents. Ha, we got you. So do you think this is overblown? Uh, I, I do think that in the sense that the that Attorney General Merrick Garland should never have done the raid on Trump, because then that forced him, when it turned out that Biden had documents, to, to criminalize the, the whole thing. It's not overblown in the sense that it is for the first time, I think, uh, the, the, the full media or full spectrum of the media is asking fair questions of the Biden administration, and they generally have given you know, a pass. Now, you would think that the tough questions would have been on inflation, crime, immigration, the price of gasoline. But the tough questions are about, you know, who put these documents in a garage, right, which is, is unlikely to affect the average person very much compared to the serious questions that the administration really generally didn't get many tough questions on. We do a lot of interviews. He was allowed to skate. So in an odd way, the benefit is that the press is waking up, realizing that they're getting uh, a, a, a large lack of transparency, are beginning to ask real questions and beginning to function like a real press again. Going into the midterms, Republicans vowed that investigations would be a top priority should they take back the House. Obviously, they did. But would this supersede those types of investigations, like investigations into the origins of COVID, as well as investigations into Hunter Biden's business dealings? Well, we'll see how the Republicans do. Frankly, they, they, the problem with congressional investigations is that a lot of people who do them spend so much time grandstanding for themselves that very little actually gets done. Uh, and, uh, and we'll see, will they get, you know, quick answers? Look, there are a couple of things, uh, big issues that, that do merit investigation. How, how did COVID get here and what was the source of its origin is, a, is, a, is a, an important global question. And it, and it was rather surprising that the previous Congress didn't put together a bipartisan commission, you know, to study that. And somehow that became, <clears throat> became politicized. Uh, I think there are real questions on the Hunter Biden laptop and, and who's involved in this. And and they're really pretty simple, right? They're, you're going to either get answers to those or or they're going to be completely dodged. Uh, and and we'll, we'll, we'll kind of see what happens with that. But I, I think that, you know, that's these investigations will not be kind of the mainstay of politics. The big questions here right now are, is Donald Trump going to be the Republican nominee? Or is he sufficiently, you know, wounded uh, that he won't be? And is Joe Biden really going to be the Democratic nominee? Uh, or what did he, was his performance and age and some of these issues, you know, going to take him, you know, out of that role? I certainly have written that I think America is looking to move forward with some new people and doesn't really want to see a replay of the last election. Let's talk about that. I do want to get into 2024. Do you think this investigation hurts Biden for another presidential run? Oh, definitely. The fact that Biden's got to answer questions and and there are so many questions around all of this. Yeah, this is this is definitely hurtful. But remember, it's not where independent counsels start their investigations mm -hmm. that usually hurt. It's where they end up. And so we don't, you know, as, as you know, sorry. as you know, with Bill Clinton, um, the investigation started with the White Order and ended with Monica Lewinsky. Will these investigations with Joe Biden start with documents and move over to Hunter Biden and the Penn Biden Center itself? You know, has always been a real question mark. And will they spread? And how far will they go? Who will report them? I, as I said to you before, I think the interesting thing is the mainstream media really does feel that they're not getting the transparency that they're entitled to. And for the first time, they're not accepting non-answers uh, to the questions. And if that standard gets applied to the administration as a whole, 
uh, I think that will be will will benefit the process, and it should be that case for for every president. It certainly, surely, when President Clinton went out to the briefing room and took questions, we would count on you know eighty five of them being rather pointed, you know, and and difficult questions, and those are the ones we prepare for. Of course, and we've definitely seen that play out in the press briefings. Over the past week, uh, reporters have really been hammering um, Crane Jean-Pierre about these documents. But do you think this opens a door for a Democrat to slide in for 2024? I think it's really too early to say uh, for sure. I think the opportunity exists regardless of what happens with these documents. Only about 40 percent of the Democrats are supporting Biden for a second term. There's a lot of concern about his age. There's a lot of concern about, uh, you know, uh, his ability really to carry out a second term and his ability to win against a fresh Republican, you know, if it's not Donald Trump. So I think there already were a lot of questions. This is going to accelerate it. Uh, but, you know, it's not over yet by any will, any, any means whatsoever. And how people handle crisis really does determine then whether they, they get to go forward. President Clinton is master in handling those kinds of crises, coming through them. Uh, Joe Biden hasn't really faced much of a crisis uh, since maybe the plagiarism scandal when he had to quit, I don't know, I think it was the 1988 presidential race. Who do you think that fresh Republican is going to be? You mentioned handling crisis. Someone that comes to mind for me is Governor Ron DeSantis in Florida. When there were storms um, in the fall of last year, he came together in a bipartisan way with President Biden to make sure his state got relief. Do you think he's the top contender here? Uh, Ron DeSantis right now is the top contender, of course, uh, Generally, you never want to be the top contender this early because uh, it becomes in everybody's interest to tear you down. So it's always a very difficult position to be in. Uh, but I, I think more generally, after having a, uh, a businessman with no government experience and having someone with all government experience and no business experience or executive experience, this is going to be a good good year for governors, both on the Democratic and the Republican side, because I think people are looking for a combination of effective leadership of big organizations, you know, the, the you know handling of emergencies like hurricanes and things that happen in the country, uh, and some real experience in in politics as well. And I think they're looking for more of a mix. So I think it's going to be the return of the governors. You heard it here first. I do want to go back to the Edelman Trust Barometer. Business wins big on trust with government lagging behind. Let's get into your world at Stagwell Inc. in digital marketing. In a recent Wall Street Journal poll, 61% of economists foresee a recession this year. First, do you think that's going to happen? Well, you know, the, the problem with economic consensus is that economic consensus is usually wrong. So, and that when everybody builds up a consensus, usually the opposite happens. So, uh, is there going to be a recession? Well, obviously, considering the fact that the Fed has been deliberately contracting the economy, uh, you know, if I were an economist, I could bet 60 40 on a recession because the Fed policy is to create a slowing down of the economy. Is that guaranteed? Are we really seeing a full recession? We're seeing certain areas like housing, you know, because of mortgage rates and others, really become much more difficult to acquire and, and slow down. But we're also seeing a lot of the bottlenecks that we're creating uh, in uh, some of the inflation in the past, uh, like the lack of chips that we're, you know, we're seeing those that that really are no longer a factor and we're even moving to a glut of chips. So I think that it's, it's nobody really knows here how far the slowdown is going to go, how slow, slow the Fed is going to uh, try to bring the economy to. Uh, and, and I think for a lot of marketers, they're kind of taking a, a wait and see attitude. Most people are not pulling back. They realize that if they pull back prematurely, 
that they will wind up losing considerable market share, you know, if, if the economy comes back and these bottlenecks are up, you know, with the exception of certain areas where the cost of money is really quite high, you know, where the price of energy goes will also be, you know, quite determinative. So far, it's come down from, you know, the highs that we faced over the, over the past summer. How is this uncertainty compared with that wait and see attitude affecting digital ad buys? Uh, we're seeing pretty healthy digital ad buys overall. Uh, I, I think that, you know, growth is somewhat moderated. Uh, I think that the digital ad buyers are getting pickier. You know, they want digital ads that work. Uh, they understand that there are now other places they could place their ads. They don't have to go only to Google and Facebook. You might go to TikTok. You might go to, you know, in, in experiment with, with the new Netflix ads. They might go to kind of the retail marketing ads that are in Walmart or Amazon. So what we're seeing now is a consumer that's more carefully evaluating its digital marketing choices. Uh, and, and I think that's something new for a lot of the tech companies. Are these more opportunities aside from the traditional ones like Netflix? Is this exciting for the um, tech companies? Well, it's exciting for the advertisers because, you know, digital marketing ads have been pretty pricey, frankly. Uh, and, and what people really want to do is effectively reach their most probable consumers on a lowest cost basis and be able to influence them either with their brand or move them to, to actual performance. You know, we at Stagro, we're developing kind of new kinds of advertising, you know, marketplaces. Uh, for example, take QR codes, you know, advertisements for things like alcohol and ice cream, you know, can be very effective, you know, while you're reading a menu. And so we're putting, looking for, for digital ads that are very close to the point of purchase. And so those kinds of ads may vastly outperform, you know, typical digital ads or 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 search word ads. And we, we've created a new stadium experience where we create a virtual world, and the virtual world can have new kinds of sponsorships so that people can see the actual stadium, but then they can actually see their virtual world at the same time. So I, I think you're going to see new types of ads and places for ads. And, and new uh, paths to effectiveness that, that really you have to look at your product. You have to look at the, at the path that people go through to kind of find uh, your product and interest in it and purchase it and, and then find the medium that is really gonna work for it. In the past, we used to just come up with the ads and then put it on all the mediums. Now I think you find the mediums first after you understand who your customers are and you design the ads to it. And that's a totally new process that we're doing at Stagwell. The Super Bowl is known, as you know, as the creme de la creme of advertisements. People like myself, not the biggest sports buff, all tune in for the commercials. So can we expect any new types of ads coming up? There are new types. I think you're going to see great ads again. I always say that the best TV ads have already been made the best digital ads have yet to be made, that people are still experimenting more with, with the digital environment to really find, you know, what has the most emotional impact in the medium that actually is a two-way medium compared to television that is a one-way medium. So I think we, we may see more use of QR codes. We may see some augmented reality incorporated into some of the, into some of the ads. Uh, but I do think either way, we're going to have some some really great ads with some wonderful, wonderful stars and iconic brands. And I, I do think that, uh, you know, it is, you know, we may be the Super Bowl of football, but it is the Super Bowl of advertising. Mark Penn, thank you so much. Thank you.